Okay. And we are now recording. And mm. what could be better than that? Dave Radigan and uh, the show or the podcast. Oh, by the way, uh, photo courtesy of Billy Weiss, Boston Red Sox, both of them. Uh, these two, this one too. View from the lone red seat. And uh, here you can see my guest today from the Sabre Boston chapter, Society of American Baseball Research. The co-chairman of the Boston chapter is Joanne Hubbard. She's an historian. She had this great pandemic project that we're gonna talk about in just a second. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm gonna basically introduce it by reading some of it. Um, Dispatches from Mudville is what it was called. And we're starting out with this little, this little gem uh, that I just think is, I loved it because it's sports writing at its finest. Um, it's not connected by the way, to this illustration, but I like the illustration. This is from 19, 1906. Uh, this story came along about 11 years later or something like that. Um, I'm sorry, 10 years, uh, whatever. It came a long way. It came a long way. Along in 1916. And uh, I'm just going re to read this from you, from uh, taken from a newspaper of that era, uh, from the Boston Daily Globe. I think we've heard of that one. And it <laughs> says, um, there was a visitor at the Giants camp this afternoon. And this is from Marlin, Texas. Yeah. Speaker, the famous center fielder of the world's champion Boston Red Sox, who motored over from his home in Hubbard City, Texas, with a party of friends to pay manager McGraw and other old friends of the Giants a short visit. Now, it's very interesting because I don't think McGraw, in any clip that I've ever read, they never mentioned his first name. Uh, True. It's, I, it's a strange, anyway, speaker was asked if he had signed to play with the Red Sox and replied, no, not yet, but they don't report until March 19th, so I have plenty of time. Now, this is March 14th that this ran. Um, and his answer implied that he would join the champions in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where they are to train on that date. He appears to be much overweight, which is a beautiful beautiful description and i'm like yeah. these sports writers and they just just throw it out you know he, he says he's fine it's very tongue-in-cheek and um and joanne I, I love this one and basically the dispatches from mudville has a whole bunch of these little gems that you found going through newspapers um and the reason i, I want to show people about, about this we were just talking about this before we, we started and the reason, one of the other reasons I like, like this is having been a journalist myself, if you read this clip, first the illustration is kind of cool. It's the planet or it's the sun or whatever, but it's, uh, if you read, it says uh, the star of the sport, more than 5 million fans inhabit this planet. Obviously the baseball is the planet. But if you read that first sentence, there were over 5 billion <laughs> paid admissions to games <laughs> in the major leagues last year. That was the kind of story. When I was a journalist, that was the kind of mistake I would make. Just miss it by a, a, a by three zeros, I stag. Um, and uh, but it's it's. I thought this was great. Dispatches from Mudville is your pandemic project. It's what yes. you did when you couldn't go outside, and so you just started to what comb comb through, uh, basically comb through history and find some good baseball history. Right, that that's correct. Um, it, it all started because of the pandemic and everything was shut down and all those meetings that I would have had uh, went by the wayside. You couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do anything. All you could do was, if you were lucky enough to still have your job, you could work, you come home, you stare at four walls, you watch television, that only lasts so long. There were no games to watch at that time. So I had to think of something that would be ongoing and keep up my interest and keep me from staring at four walls. Yeah. Okay, you can read books, you can do all sorts of things, but you know, something that would be a challenge. Now, I had been gathering bits and pieces out of newspapers for a long time for other uh, particular projects that I was doing. So that was nothing new to me. And then I just decided, okay, what can I do for the duration? Who knows how long this is going to last, but I can do it week after week, you know, just once a week, don't get overboard. And I'll do it for one year. And that's what I said, because I said, oh, 
think we'll be fine in a year. Well, I was almost right. Um, and I continue on that way. And why do I say dispatches from Mudville? Well, um, what I have to say is that and everybody says, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. That's sweet. Nobody, that's really nobody, nobody believes this. You're just making yeah. this up. Yeah, that's right. I'm just using <laughs> you know, my job. But no, but actually the neighborhood that I live in, it's an old neighborhood. Our first set of being built around in the 1850s. And it has been known as Mudville since the 1850s. Now, it wasn't a baseball reference that got it going. It was a political thing. Uh, but we like to think that Ernest there knew about our Mudville because he was in the area. He was close by. He lived in Worcester at a summer home out towards Milford Menden area. And so it's possible he could have heard about Mudville. And uh, the guys in this neighborhood, they were playing baseball. They were mainly um, of Irish immigrant. Uh, families uh, that came up. And of course, uh, even in uh, the small provincial town here, uh, no Irish need apply on those baseball teams until, until they found out how good they could play. And then all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> they let a few play here. And it. it took a while to integrate the team, as it were, uh, for the locals, uh, but they finally got around to uh, out of the sense of the uh, you know, practicality for heaven's sake, you got to get the good players, otherwise, somebody else is going to take them. But anyway, the so history, I, I history live in, of sports in the United States, the, the Italians, yeah. uh, anyway. right? Exactly, all the way up there. You know, luckily, by the time the Italians came around here, they were much more relaxed, and the Italians got in on the game uh, pretty much right away. So, uh, you know, when I, I, I'm sitting here in the middle of Mudville right now, and I can look out my door and see a half dozen references to the game of baseball. For instance, it's Mudville. Uh, mm -hmm. Next door, Willie Supple. He was a he, he was a National League umpire for a very brief period of time. Andy Cameron across the street played for the Outlaw League in Vermont. My house had the Connell brothers, and two doors down was John McGinnis, who played minor league under Hugh Duffy back around 1913. So it, it is probably even more out there, really. But the thing is, uh, what what really got me going was that uh, for starters, is um, baseball has to do with the neighborhood I live in, the town that I live in, the state that I live in, and New England and beyond, and uh, Massachusetts to the United States. And it is one really significant historical thread that permeates just about every other aspect of our social, political, uh, uh, everything to do with our lives. For instance, if you were to go uh, over to Europe and you walk by somebody in the airport and he's got a ball cap on, where do you think he's from? Most likely the United States. It's part of our American uniform. Uh, ball caps are, are ubiquitous now, but you, if you look at photographs of crowds uh, from the 1960s or earlier, you don't really see baseball caps by any stretch a few but it's not like you see today where the crowd uh, is is uh, you know over 50 percent of people are wearing baseball caps you see that we wear t-shirts how many how many baseball t-shirts do you own me I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, not enough <laughs> Not enough. Right, not enough. Uh, I got a whole stack of commemorative ones, ones that were given to me, uh, different color ones, and all the, you know, it, it, the whole bit. I only yeah, wear the you, things that were given to me. I've got a Atlanta, Atlanta Falcons uh, Super Bowl <laughs> champion t shirts and Washington Capitals 2021 World Stanley <laughs> Cup champs. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. We all wear that stuff. I mean, I got all a ton of them. But you the know, stuff we, that, yeah, we have. Yeah, it, it affects our food. You know, hot dogs. You can go to the store and buy ballpark mustard. You know, I mean, my God. Yeah, yeah. We we have it in our food. In politics, I found baseball that touched upon politics right from the oh, mid nineteenth yeah. century, right on. And not only because of the characters. For instance, you know, uh, you know, Honey Fitz, who ran for mayor of Boston. Well, there was a little bit of uh, baseball subterfuge in there. Not that I think that it caused him to win, but maybe he thought that little ploy, or at least uh, his buddy Jimmy thought so. Uh, but that's another story you'll have to read up because it, it, it is in the in the dispatches. But I it don't have that I don't, everything. I don't have that story on my list, but, uh, it uh, is, but I, no, I remember the story and I remember thinking that sounds like Boston politics. Yes, and it does sound like Boston oh. politics. You know, and it is uh, women. You know, I kept an eye out for women. And the uh, February 19th one, I dealt a lot about uh, women in that one. 
it, but it does have to do with women's suffrage and because uh, they held rallies at Fenway Park yep. for women's suffrage. Uh, I mean, and then just women playing baseball. But the other uh, thing and you, you can do too just, is you can, you can trace the, the changing attitudes of, of right. society as you read some of these stories and you read, because sometimes yeah. the players would talk about things other than, was it Frank, right. Frank Home Run Baker who said his daughter might be, might be, uh, might play like, baseball someday. She yeah. might play baseball someday. And the sports writer made a comment that, yeah, maybe someday they'll be able to vote too or something. Was it the sports writer who made the, the women comment? get the vote too? Ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. And it was 1914. <laughs> and it was like, wow. They yeah. What a comment. Yet. It's just great stuff. You know, it's funny. You know, I mean, I would go out, you know, my routine was I would sit down and I, I would look a hundred years ago. I would try that ploy first. And then I would just take like uh, the random day, for instance, I would file on a Friday. So I would take that Friday day, say it was uh, February 19th. And I would try other February 19th to see if, if other years there was anything good. And, um, and, and I would find things that way. But, you know, I'd go off on uh, other tracks and I swear there was stuff that found me instead of me finding it. Yeah, you know, I think it's when land in my lap and I say, wow, where did this come from? Yeah, I think that's yeah. the, nature, the yeah. nature of historical uh, research. Right. Yeah, you, it, it is. Yeah. You and might get said, all kinds of things that you didn't expect. Let me get that's let me, the thing. Let me go to the next uh, the next one that I pulled out of here. And yeah. I should mention for the majority of people who listen to the podcast, some people watch the podcast. And for those of you who are um, who are listening, I'm going to try and describe some of these illustrations so you don't miss out completely. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, yeah. These are all is illustrations taken from the uh, the Boston newspapers or newspapers of the time, including yeah. this uh, right now. I've got an advertisement for the Boston <laughs> Theater in Boston. And, oh, yes. uh, and a thing about uh, play, uh, people on vaudeville. This is really about the um, the off season. I have a couple of stories that I pulled out of the off season. I'm going to read two of them, and then we'll just get to the third one. Um, the first one was uh, New York, Babe Ruth. This is sad because it was 1921. <laughs> Babe Ruth, well-known Yankee, base cleaner, has been tendered full privileges and the withal for bandit swatting. The Bambino Wednesday sought and procured without the usual red tape, a permit to tote a gun. Officials thought he'd probably be able to do more damage if he carried a bat around, but hopefully he is effective against these stray bandits as he is against pitch ball that's stray near the home base. That's for the Boston Post, January 6, 1921. Um, and then I thought this was funny, and I, I know why you put this in. Uh, uh, San Francisco, uh, what was the dateline? Pitcher Crumpler, again, they don't use the first name, Pitcher Crumpler, a left-hander, has been obtained from the Detroit Americans for the San Francisco Club of the Pacific Coast League. It was announced today. Crumpler, according to Ty Cobb, has the reputation of being a second Babe Ruth when it comes to hitting. That was from January 6, 1921. And uh, as you've got in here, uh, in 1920, Roy, uh, Roy Crumpler, pitcher, uh, went two games. Uh, he pitched two games. He got one win. And then the next year, or no, I'm sorry, five years later, Philadelphia Phillies played in three games, had no wins. So didn't quite, didn't quite make the, uh, the Ruthian <laughs> status. Uh, this brings us to vaudeville because this, uh, uh oh, maybe I missed this one. Let's see. Well, while you're looking for that about Crumpler, um, the, one of my favorite things to do was to find players who had short careers. Sometimes their backstories were much more interesting than the long-termers. You, you know something? It's very funny because you love the, 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 is it Moonlight Graham? Was that the, was that the yes, character? Yes, Moonlight Graham. There is a Moon Gra yeah, and there is a Moonlight Graham Society, actually, out of Boston, by the way, a competition of your, uh, you know, it's another group. Yes, okay. very high-minded. <laughs> They well, oh, it's really, yeah, it, it is a society that lets in members for people who um, basically the three members who had started it, they all had um, extremely minor league, like probably one hit careers with minor league teams. They would go and beg these teams to let them get the uniform on, get out there on the field and actually have like a one day contract and things like that. It's great. But oh, that's cool. You, you go through total baseball or baseball encyclopedia or page after page after page, and you can find 
a whole bunch. There are books written about these cup of coffee players, as they are called. Yeah. And they are more fascinating to me than these ones that, you know, more fascinating than Babe Ruth. <laughs> wow. Even, yeah. after you, even after you bought the gun? Um, yeah, even after you bought the gun. I, <laughs> I know, I painted it as I'm going, what in heaven's name? You know? But uh, of course, when he left Boston, the writers had a field day taunting him uh, after he left. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know, for they, they, obviously. They, they like to taunt people. It sold papers and oh, it, yes. it played to anyway, Neil O'Hara, who was a oh, great, yes. great sports writer from the 20s. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. got this piece from him from February 2, 1921. Uh, the ball gamers don't go in vaudeville anymore. And that helps. That's his uh, <laughs> that's his headline. And uh, I got to tell you that Nick Altrock, who I'm about to mention, is uh, with Washington, which apparently was not a very good team in 1921. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's the story. The story is this. One of the biggest improvements of baseball is that the boys don't go into vaudeville now. The modern ball gamers are so busy holding out in the winter, they've got no time for the two-a-day, uh, which I guess was the two-a-day shows. Right, a, yeah. A variety fan with a yearning to see a ball player act has to wait for the season to open. <laughs> then Nick Altrock steps out and the laughs begin to pile up. Nick is the star of the Washington team. He keeps his club next to closing on the second division bill. <laughs> Fantastic. And then McGraw is an actor once again. They don't mention his first name. And he's got suspension cards <clears throat> from an actor's club to prove it. <laughs> Back one over the Big Ten circuit telling how the Giants won the flag. That was one of the years they did. He caught 3000 a week for his monologue in that pennant winning year. The Derby was divided in just one way and went to the manager of the Giants. But that was some time ago. Mac no longer pals around with actors. Um, George Stallings also spoke a piece in vaudeville. That was in 1914 when George recited how the brave snatched the banner. He was never booked in that act again. <laughs> Because they never won again. Huey, no. Jennings, uh, Huey Jennings headlined one consecutive season as the Auburn Thrush of Scranton, Pennsylvania. The VOD fans liked Huey so much, he practiced law the following season. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, and Rabbit Moranville. He doesn't call him Rabbit. He starts it out with by Moranville. Also peddled solos in front of the spotlight a couple of seasons back. The Rabbit was not an animal act. He got his bookings on his merit. But B.F. Keefe never offered Tangway, Caruso, or Fraganza the ex in exchange for the Springfield kid. I assume <laughs> that those were opera singers. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Other performers on the stage. Yeah. So he was not of that quality. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it's very, very funny. And it's a, uh, it's a nice little thing, but it goes to the idea that, again, back then, they didn't make the money that they made now. Even, right. even when I started following baseball in the 60s and 70s, they were yeah, making, right. you know, but Tommy Heinsohn told me yeah. that he made more money selling insurance in the offseason. And again, basketball. Now, baseball, that's money. correct. Yeah. They and they also, they also made more money uh, a lot of times playing on minor league teams as right. well. Yeah. Right. We're going to actually get to that. Oh, and those mm -hmm. for those of you who are, who are watching and not listening, We've got a picture of uh, Babe Ruth there because what I did is I went out of order and this was the picture that should have been up when we were talking about him buying the, uh, buying the, <laughs> buying the gun. But what a, what a face, what a face on this guy. It's, it's funny because it's so iconic. And yet I look at it now and I'm like, he just, it, it's a really interesting, he's got a re really interesting broad face in, face. in that, yeah. you know, you, you don't know what's going on there exactly. In this particular picture, but for to think about the guy being as excellent as he was in sports. Um, well, yeah, he was you know, unhappy think, in 1919. <laughs> you know, we, and, and when we think about him, we always think about him in those those old pictures where he's got the, the little stubby legs and he's running around the bases too, too fast. <laughs> yeah. and, he, and he's heavy and he's, you know, late in his career because oddly enough, he didn't, uh, as you probably have heard, he didn't take care of himself the way some of them do. Um, anyway, on to the next picture. This is uh, just before the start of the season. There's a there's a, yeah. a cartoon of a fan with uh, at the at the table with the menu in front of him, and he's saying, "Hey, when do we eat? Bring that grub along," uh, yeah. indicating the that they're looking forward to the start of the season. And this goes to the um, yeah 
off season and the, and the way that they used to, people think that uh, contract negotiations played out in the press are something new. Clearly they're not. This is from 1921. Um, Mike Minoski wants, want to play center field. He believes he is the fastest outfielder on the team and says he was limited in handicap in the short left field at Fenway Park last season. I believe I could do my best work in center field. Michael continued and quote, and I intend to speak to manager Duffy about it as soon as I have had a business talk with Frazee. There is little question of salary to be considered. I will operate under a new contract and believe I am entitled to an increase. I do not anticipate any trouble in this direction, however. However. <laughs> very well-spoken, very well-spoken guy for a baseball player. Uh, it is evident that Frazee does not intend to talk business with the dissatisfied players until all are here. The Sox owner went up to Little Rock today and something that is not connected with baseball. Uh, this is Boston <laughs> Herald. So he kind of just ignored people until they showed up. And then I'm sure that they all had equal leverage. And uh, this is a player. This is this, this goes to what you were saying. This is something else you had about um, the, a fellow from Peabody. Peabody, Massachusetts, uh, and the story is written by Burt Whitman, and we're going to talk about Burt Whitman and, oh, a Bert, second, yeah. and also one of your other favorite uh, uh, favorite reporters that you found. Um, but Burt Whitman is talking about uh, consider the case of Chick Davies of Peabody. All you baseball magnates, it is worth your attention and shows one of the things with which you must contend, probably more so in the coming season than ever before. Lloyd G. Davies is a natural athlete and just as naturally a good hitter. He starred all over the place for PVD High and was a chum of Stuffy McGinnis. Naturally, then, he went to the old athletics. He was primarily a pitcher, but was good in the outfield when he was not in the box. He was with the A's six years ago when they were licked four straight in the World Series by the Braves. He did not get a full share, only a fractional part. It's so interesting the way they convey that information. In yes. a very unspecific way, but that's very specific, but unspecific. And, and anyway, busy summer for Chick. This is his subhead. He became a little disappointed and a trifle discouraged at the way he was going in the big league game. He could not get a big salary from the A's. And eventually he decided to get out of the grind of pro ball and did. He decided that he could pick up a good lot of money pitching semi-pro around Eastern Massachusetts. And yeah. this goes to what, what you were saying. Yeah. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. According to, I'm going back to this Whitman story. He combined these semi-pro games with business. Right now, it has taken the line of an elastic belt. So this guy apparently was a pitcher, belt salesman, <laughs> and he is doing well. But the particularly interesting part is the way he picked up so many semi-pro games of ball to pitch last summer. summer. He worked in 59 of them, and the chances are that he averaged at least $75 a game which gives him a salary during the baseball season of $300. <laughs> so I guess this would, would be during the 300 a week, which is pretty good money. Pretty good. Yeah. Money pretty good money for the time. Yeah. And he's pretty good. Mm. Pretty good business is playing ball at odd times, usually Saturdays, Sundays and holidays and piling up a total like that. And yet kept busy and yet keep busy with a regular business. It gives the baseball men something to think about. It, it shows just how sound, I've got to flip the page, <laughs> how sound the baseball is outside the big leagues and that the average good player is not absolutely compelled to hook up with an American or National League team to make his salt and sugar. Great expression, <laughs> salt and sugar. I think somebody should tell actively <laughs> about that. Um, yeah. And uh, Davis, Davis is an inspiration to the independent young athlete of rare baseball attainments. And he gives the magnates something over which to think. Also, he gives the impression that the talk about the big leagues being a combination, a combination and restraint of trade and that no player of real ability can make money unless he is in with the combine is a lot of junk. And it is a sign that baseball really is the national game when a young man can go out, ignore the major and strong minor leagues and do what Davies has done. This is from the Boston Herald. January 15, and that's by Frank Burton, Burt Whitman, uh, sports editor for the Boston Herald for 31 years. Yes. And, and you, yeah. you were a big fan. So it talks about I'm a big things. fan of him. Yeah, I'm a it big fan about, of him. And it talks about two things. One is the fact that baseball players were making a decent amount of money, more so than they were making in the majors. 
Right. Um, yeah. And also the fact that, um, and it also kind of displays this style of writing that uh, that's just so entertaining. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like you say, they bared everything. Yeah. And, and, and another thing that uh, that I had found too was you know, really great writing, classical way of writing, uh, coming out of the 19th century. For instance, that all um, all of the great writers um, would add like poetry, and they would write short stories and add it to the print. Uh, especially in the right. 19th century. And that, uh, that whole penchant for poetry uh, came over into the 1900, 1920 era. After 1920, uh, poetry went out and more photography was coming in and taking its place. And also I think a lot of the writing suffered for that because they were going over to a more um, a straight online type of stuff uh, where they would tell the story and be done with it and leave out all that extra frills that they used to have such as the poetry or the sidelines or that marvelous writing uh with with uh, phrases that come from the 19th century i can't imagine dan shaughnessy doing that today <laughs> <laughs> no. or anything like that and it just is a thrill and it's so entertaining to read uh, starting way back even in the 1850s and 60s um and, and i often wondered how uh, baseball reporting really got going in the newspapers. And I contend that it probably had to do with getting the people working on newspapers interested in the game. There was a marvelous game that was played on Boston Common and the two teams were made up of all workers on all the major Boston dailies. And it seemed that after that, they were paying more attention to it. They were writers, the printers, uh, in all sorts of manners of, of the, the types of people that would put a newspaper out. And it seemed that after that, baseball got more print line in the newspapers as it came out. And then it just exploded after the Civil War. Oh. Uh, that uh, 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 the men were coming back. And one thing that they did, they, the proliferation of baseball teams is just explosive. Uh, there were newspapers like the Globe in the 1880s where they would have a, virtually a whole page of all game, you know, this game, this team is playing that team, this team wants to play this, you know, yeah, you know right to so-and-so if you'll uh, you know, take the challenge up. And there would be over 100 of them listed out like that. And uh, then you get off into the sidelines. But you, you see uh, teams of Irish descent with uh, names that uh, depicted that. But also the African-Americans that came in. Uh, Tim Murnane, who played for um, the before, Boston the National hold, hold, Team hold in Boston. Before, before yeah. we turn to Tim Murnane, I just want to get one oh, more thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to get Tim Murnane at least a little line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the Ted, Ted Williams. Ted Williams. Ah. Is, um, when, when, uh, when Whitman passed away, uh, Burt mm -hmm. Whitman, he died suddenly. He died from a brain aneurysm, I think, uh, yes. 62 years old. So, mm -hmm. you know, my age. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going, if I if I stop at any time during the Zoom, uh, that's probably what it was. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just keep going until we run, keep out, going. Of, we run out of <laughs> run out of battery. Um, but Ted Williams made a, a personal phone call from St. Louis to the Herald, um, to express his regret. Um, yeah. And I've met Williams and Williams obviously was famous with not uh, not being a fan. I, I met him way after his his playing days were over. I was with Johnny Pesky at, at something and he was in a really good mood. It's the only time as a reporter that I ever got anyone's autograph because I was starstruck. <laughs> and he, wrote, he took my reporter's notepad and he wrote, remember sports writers aren't always right. <laughs> <laughs> he signed it <laughs> ah, and, that's great yeah and it's so the story is and i've got this from the boston herald may 9th uh, 1949 uh the two had been close friends ever since the slugging red sox outfielder broke into the major leagues in 1938 and many times it was whitman who took williams aside and counseled him when things were not running too smoothly ted called the st john's hospital in, in st louis uh, when he learned that women had been rushed there in an ambulance and then broke down and cried when he received the news that Bert had passed away. Yeah. And I think that's uh, really 
um, it's illustrative of the relationship that um, between the, the writers of the day and and Williams of the uh, or the players of, of, the day. of that time. Yeah, and, and, especially Williams. Yeah. And here you've got Williams, who was always feuding with the press and always mm -hmm. angry and a, and a mercurial but very interesting guy, you know, very, very uh, a lot of different levels to have uh, to him. And um, it was just really interesting that he would, yeah. he would make that call. And obviously they, they, I bet they were very close and I bet that Ted had a lot of, he probably had a lot of things to, uh, that, that um, there were probably a lot of times that Williams probably could use, could, could have used a little counseling and uh, <laughs> it was good that he was, uh, that, that women was able to, to, to do that with him. Um, but I thought that was, I thought the, inter, the, the relationship between athletes and, um, not just athletes, but Richard Johnson, the curator of the New, New England Sports Museum, he was talking yeah. about a book that he had written and uh, same thing, some fairly obscure players. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of players, and this is true in the high school level and the college level, but mm -hmm. when the money's not big, you're, you're very, I, I can't, who knows when the next time is that we'll see this at the major league level. But um, you mentioned Murnane, uh, and we're going to get to him in a second, but, um, you yeah. know, the, the player retires and then he becomes an umpire or, and obviously sometimes they become coaches, but that's sort of almost linear, but somebody becomes an, um, becomes an umpire or they go into a football refereeing and a different sport mm -hmm. because back then they needed to make a living, you know, the, the athlete's career was a whole, it was kind of a unique little thing. And then when they were done, they could start over at another profession. And, um, and so Murnane is, uh, was one of your favorite, uh, was one of your favorites. And this is actually the last one that I've got. Okay. Um, uh, Murnane became probably as well known is, was he better known off the field, on the field? Where was, tell me, tell me what made him so great to you. Um, the writing. I think he was a capable and a very good baseball player. Uh, and he moved over to writer and he had no, like he didn't graduate from college with a, uh, a degree in English literature or anything like that. He really probably learned the job on the job as many of them did. And it just clicked with him and he probably just had the natural aptitude for it. Uh, but uh, I found him to be really um, very unique. Uh, he told a lot of stories about players. Uh, one particular one that really got to me, and I know that I put it in uh, the notes, was about a player named William Selden. And he wrote on uh, December 24th, I think, 1888, he wrote a whole feature article in his column in the Globe about William Selden. Now, you would not probably have run across him unless you were doing a deep dive into Boston baseball history. Uh, because William Selden was um, African-American and uh, he did know Murnane because Selden had been the mascot on the National League team in Boston back in the 1870s. And I think that probably the guys must have taught Selden a few things because he became a very capable pitcher. And he, uh, he joined up with the Cuban Giants, uh, which was a team of, of African-Americans, none of them Cuban, by the way, uh, that um, uh, played games up and down the Eastern Seaboard. And Selden was uh, very well known for that. Um, but he wrote a lovely article about him and it was not in any way patronizing or anything like that. I mean, it was a very, very nice article. But there were a lot of African-American players floating around Boston back in the 19th century and the early 20th. We don't know about them. Some of them we don't know just because uh, their, their race was never mentioned and, and you had to sort of fall upon it on some article. I didn't know that Selden was uh, African-American until I came across that article. I'd seen him listed in others. Uh, Alfred Jupiter is another one uh, who was a pitcher. He was a cup of coffee player, really. But I really liked that guy. Uh, you know, he, he um, uh, Jupiter uh, was the manager of one of the minor league teams in Boston that was not black. <laughs> get, you know, get a load. Yeah, I said, how did that happen? You know, that was wonderful. And he went on to run a pool hall on Washington Street. Great story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here it was quite a, a place to be. Yeah, not the uh, career but, trajectories that we see today. 
Right, but Murnane was a very even-handed, fair-minded writer. Uh, and uh, he, I do expect and suspect that he did write a little bit of poetry on the side and also some short stories, which uh, he didn't put his name on. Um, but that was, uh, the, that tended to be uh, the way things were done back then, because after all, if you're a high and mighty uh, sports editor at the Globe, then you're not going to be putting your name on these uh, cute little stories otherwise. But I think he probably dabbled in that as well. But he, he was very highly regarded by all uh, you know, all writers and and whenever a bunch of us get together, we talk about oh, you know what, what sports writers did you like? Murnane always comes up as one of the special writers, and he's wonderful. That's interesting. And as the headline just... said when he died, you know, I think you might have read the headline uh, when when he died, when he died suddenly. Uh, Murnane drops dead at theater. I thought that was oh, rather callous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That yes. is so callous. I thought that was awful. And it went around the whole United States and all the papers picked it up. Couldn't you be a little more sensitive than that? Well, you know, it does tell you the story. He, he, was, he was out to dinner and then he went to the theater, right? Well, I, I'm not sure about the dinner part of it. He met his wife at the Boylston Street you know, train, trolley train station and they walked to the theater. And I'm not even really sure if he got to see the play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even really sure. It was something about taking his wife's coat to the coat room or something, and boom, he goes down. Yeah. And yeah, drops dead at theater. I said, my God, that is so callous. <laughs> no. it, hey, listen, who went when where? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, those those were all. I didn't have one. If, if I had known we were going to end on Renee, I would have grabbed a Renee clip to, uh, oh, to read. We could have done one whole hour just on one of the dispatches. So yeah, this, there, you, there's, there's a lot. Yeah. Of it. Was it fun? It was fun to do. It was, a, it, it was was really fun to do. It was a challenge. It kept me going and disciplined and kept me doing something week after week. Yeah, yeah. it did. Yeah. And, it, and also at a time when you really needed to have something to divert your attention for a while. Yeah. It's funny because when I, when I first, I, I stumbled on it and I started to yeah. read it. And I, and I loved it as a project. And I thought this is the perfect, it, it's, it's a really good thing for a writer or historian to do for the reasons you said during, mm -hmm. during a time like this, or, yeah. or it's the sort of thing you would do if you were a, um, uh, a serial killer and you were <laughs> yes. like, I want to write my manifesto. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I do, I do send out a challenge uh, to anybody else who would like to do this. Uh, you know, and I, I got started just looking at uh, the town that I live in, the neighborhood, just the town. Every town probably has a deep baseball history that you don't know about. Where did they play 100 years ago or even 150 years ago? Uh, who are the players? What effect did it have on your town? Uh, the baseball had a huge effect on the town that I live in, even my neighborhood. Every town probably has that same kind of history. I mean, uh, base, it was mostly baseball for me, but it also led me to basketball, a little bit of football, eh, pedestrianism. How about professional bicycle racing? Yeah. You know, yeah. Next time you go to Worcester when you're on Major Taylor Boulevard, uh, that was not a military guy. That was a professional baseball, a, ba a, 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 base, a ba bicycle racer. <laughs> And uh, one of the best there ever was. And what a history he has. Go out and find it. Really? <laughs> Go out and find it. Yeah. I'll keep yeah. that in mind. Well, one, one final question. If you were, yeah. let's say this, let's say you're yeah. an historian or you're a person looking for something new and, and, and you hear about this and you think, oh, that might be interesting. Uh, yeah. One thing Lee Montville mentioned was it's a lot easier to research history now. Than yes. It was. Uh -huh. Yes, correct. Uh, you can get a lot of newspapers. Uh, most of what I got was um, digital online at various sites. And if you want to start out, uh, you can get a free, um, a free link into uh, digital newspapers on Library of Congress. 
Uh, it's not as uh, comprehensive as other places, but it might just be enough to get you addicted to doing it. And I'm warning you, this can be very <laughs> addictive. <laughs> it can but be. you start out there, and then there are several other sites like Genealogy Bank and newspapers.com that give you places like the Globe and the Herald and, and all of that. You got to pay for those. But uh, when I use them practically every day for not only baseball, but for other things, uh, it's well worth the money. It's not that expensive, but um, uh, that's where I would do most of the searching. Certainly is better, like Lee Montville said, where I know that Lee probably started out uh, probably at the Boston Public Library, cranking the old microfilm machines until the arm fell off, uh, <laughs> looking for stuff at random. This way you can uh, search by keywords. You know, you know, one of my things was that take baseball, and add another word at random, whatever it is. I don't care what it is. Oh, just awesome. baseball and something else and just be as crazy about it as you want. And you will be amazed at how baseball has permeated everything. Do you have an example? <laughs> Do you have an example of that? The, the, the craziest thing you can think of that you did baseball and what crazy? Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. It was, um, of course, there's so many of them. Uh, baseball and hobble skirts. What? What's a baseball hobble skirt? This is uh, you're talking 1880s, 18. Well, basically most of the 19th century, they were like bustles, you know, the bustle skirts, but also hobble skirts. And they did, they did still make them into the early 1900s. It was a type of skirt that women wore. But there was a player. There was a player that um, was um, uh, his nickname uh, had to do with um, hobble skirts. Really? And apparently it was. Uh, uh, it was implied it was about the way he uh, ran. <laughs> so, it, 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 just anything. Um, baseball and ghosts. Baseball and insanity. Ba yeah, insane. Oh, I got a ton of stuff on that because there were several baseball teams that that were formed at insane asylums. Okay. Really? Yeah. Yes. Not always the inmates, but sometimes it was just the workers there that would play baseball to entertain the inmates. Uh, and uh, baseball and whiskey, baseball and beer. You know, those were kind of like obvious ones. Yeah, they were. Those were, those yeah, were yeah, the laughs, I think. Yeah, yeah, and it just went on and on and on like that. Or uh, and the other one, of course, that I did a research project on was uh, baseball nicknames, and they were very fertile about nicknames back in the 19th century. We have lost the touch uh, in in later years, but they would pull them out of uh, Greek mythology and Roman mythology and uh, oh, everything out of very strange places that I would have to do deep research to find out where it came from. Um, who is it? Kinney Kinnick Quack, okay? There was a player for, uh, I think it was in Cleveland. Kinney Kinnick Quack, well, what's this Kinney Kinnick? Well, you look it up. It is a, it's a plant, it's ground cover. Well, guess what? Kenny Kinnick Quack was an outfielder. He was a center fielder. He covered a lot of ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's I great. love it. Yeah, try to find out what in heaven's name. Yeah, it, the nicknames were just, in, it, the imagination would run wild. It was fabulous. Uh, that was one of the best things. But you can do it with any word, anything that at random. And you just keep you know, going through it to see what you can find. And, and the problem is you also come up with other stuff. Yeah, you come up with the other stuff. I, I think that, that was how I came up with the bears, which is one of the, the last stories that I did. I put in the word bear. I think it was doing animals at that time. And I came up with a story about how they were, uh, somebody in the United States was importing bears from the French Pyrenees and shipping them out to the Midwest as, as uh, farm animals in order to like pull wagons and do heavy work. Now, can you imagine going out in the morning and hitching up your bear? Come on. Now, how did that work out? <laughs> I'm sure it was fine in Game of Thrones. Um, well, yeah, you know. Oh, it, but it was really funny, but that was on a page that had another baseball story on it. And I said, I, I can't let this go. And do you know that I would get more feedback comments about those things than even the baseball stories? No, you wouldn't. <laughs> Those go in, if, if, and you had a few of those in there that I read, and I, yeah. I know why they go in there, because they're just so... You can't pass them up. Yeah, yeah. yeah the anti-vaxxers of 1921, they, yeah. were, they actually had a society for it, you know? I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah but, but it was there, and it was, yeah, and it just went on and on. And those are sometimes the stories that found me. 
in, instead of me having to go look for them. Wow. You know, they would just pop up. Yeah, they, they just pop up. So, so you're not going to turn this into a book. I don't know. I'm, I, I, I keep thinking that maybe the, the internet where they are accessible is maybe the best place for them. I do have a meeting with my uh, co-chairs next month uh, to discuss such things. All right. Um, you know, just to see you know, what I want to. I thought about doing it, uh, but I don't know. It, it might be kind of fun. It yeah. Might be fun. Yeah, it might be fun to do that. Um, but there's so many other projects to do too. Sure. There's there's uh, there's so many <laughs> yeah. things to do. Anyway, yeah. if you if you want to access this, uh, thank you, Joanne. Yes. Joanne Hubbard is the uh, the author. It's Dispatches mm -hmm. from Mudville, and it can be found on the uh, the Boston chapter for the Society of American Baseball Research, SABR, yep. S-A-B-R. And if you just Google yep. Boston chapter, Society of uh, SABR, right. it comes yeah, up. You, 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 you should be able to find it even if you Google and just put in a few keywords, you know, like my name and Mudville Dispatches, SABR, S-A-B-R. And some combination of that usually brings it up. And if that doesn't work, try baseball and bear. And yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll <laughs> domesticated bears. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. <laughs> uh, Joanne, thanks again. Okay. Thank you very much and keep in touch. Thanks. I'll do that. Right. I'll be back okay. next year. All right. Okay. See bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> this has been View from the Low from the Lone Red Seat. Tune in next week for whatever we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to do, but I'm sure it'll be great. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in.